I'm uh, Michael Heinrich. I'm the co-founder and CEO of ZeroG.ai. We're the fastest modular AI chain. And what that means essentially is that we put uh, AI models onto a blockchain so that it can be run in a fully decentralized context. So I've been following the space probably since 2013. Um, I was at Stanford actually around, around that time. And Bitcoin was very well discussed amongst my classmates and professors. So I spent some time with like Tim Draper, for example, uh, Mark and Reeson talked about it too. I was actually in an auditorium at that point, <laughs> listening to him. Um, and I was like, okay, I should really check this out. And so I invested into Bitcoin through uh, Coinbase and then did the whole like ICO boom as an investor in 2016, 17, and then kept investing in the space. I started out as a engineer and technical product manager. So I worked at Microsoft and SAP Labs. I worked uh, after that at Bain and & Company and Bridgewater Associates before coming back to Stanford and then starting a Web2 uh, startup company that I scaled to about 650 people, 100 million in contracted AR. I raised about 130 million in venture financing for that as well. So it was a top YC and unicorn company. Um, and we used AI kind of uh, quite a bit in the data cleaning process um, as, I was, as I was building the company. And so I would say I'm not at the implementation level anymore, but I'm definitely very familiar with a lot of the technical concepts. Basically, try to use my management consulting skill set and like build an analysis of the market. And then three months later, I realized like I did a great analysis, but I had zero product to show for it. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, maybe I should go back and utilize more my engineering and like product management mindset. At that point, I also realized I have some knowledge gaps. So that's when I actually said, okay, I should go back to Stanford and enroll in, in uh, some interesting courses that actually helped me become a better entrepreneur. And I think the breakthrough that I had was in uh, Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad class. Yeah, so that, that was phenomenal for me because it was all about get outside of the building, talk to potential customers, utilize like this business model canvas and then figure out what your value proposition is, i.e. your uh, product market fit, and then be very systematic, like step by step. And then when you've talked to 100 people in the space, then you essentially know the industry and you have a good business model. Actually, um, fun story, the person that connected me to the other two co-founders, uh, Thomas, he was actually my classmate at Stanford. And so, um, yeah, you never know <laughs> when you take a class with somebody, they, they end up becoming your co-founder. So this was 2022, he called me and basically said, five years ago, I invested in Conflux and Ming and Fan are two of the co-founders and I want to start something more global scale. And he asked me, like, would I be interested in chatting? I know you've been investing in Web3. I know you wanted to do something in the space. And so I said, like, yeah, let's explore. And then six months of co-founder dating later, we basically, uh, I was like, wow, these are the best engineers and computer scientists that I've ever worked with. Like, we need to start something. And we've got people from MIT, CMU, Stanford. The way we thought about it initially was we wanted to have at least two years of runway and we want to have enough funds to actually build the basic infrastructure. And so that's how we derived the five million. Um, and then essentially what happened is I spoke to some friendly investors and they were super excited about what we're building. And they're like, hey, we're happy to give you a term sheet. And then um, I started getting a lot of introductions to other investors. And I think the fourth term sheet came from uh, HackVC after a few conversations with them and pretty deep technical diligence. Once that happened, then a lot of other investors started hearing about it and they were all like, oh, we have to invest. We have to, we have to, this is, this is like the next thing. We got pretty quickly like 5x, 10x oversubscribed and eventually like 20x as, as we kind of um, uh, continued the fundraise. And what I had to do is I had to essentially tranche the different pricing tiers. So we went through, uh, at that time, the Stanford Blockchain Accelerator. And so we got a lot of introductions through um, uh, that team. So, so Kun and Gil and Steven uh, are part of it. So if you're interested in Web3, definitely check that out. <laughs> um, and then for my personal network as well. So those were the two key sources. Um, I think one of the key things as well is to think about like who are the absolutely the key investors that I want as part of this round. And then, especially in Web3, do I do a, a round where there's like one major lead investor or do I do more of a distributed cap table? 
Um, so that's another challenge to kind of think through. For us, we wanted a distributed cap table because the ethos of Web3 is very much around a decentralized community building uh, sphere. So your investors are actually part of that community. Mm -hmm. And then when you have them in your community, they invite you to events and you get to speak there. They, they help with kind of follow on financing. They help with introducing new projects that can utilize your infrastructure. And so we very much went for more of a distributed cap table approach. As we built the presentation and got some feedback from initial uh, investors, I also modified some of the story because I was like, oh, this doesn't sound quite as uh, convincing. At this point, it doesn't make quite as much sense. And then created a very compelling story over kind of the first month, I would say. Did you have any failed pitch stories? <laughs> failed pitch stories. Um, Hard to say what failed is exactly, but but sometimes you know going through an entire pitch only to figure out that the investor doesn't is like a later stage investor or doesn't invest in your sector. So I'd say that's kind of a funny awkward uh, moment at the end. So what I usually do in the beginning is just ask like, okay, what type of check amounts do you invest in? At what stage do you invest in? How variation sensitive are you? Just just to kind of understand where that investor's head is at. Uh, to avoid situations like that, because I've definitely been in <laughs> presentations like that. For uh, Web3 specifically, it's uh, really, uh, as I mentioned, uh, just want to harp on this point because it's uh, very true. It's still very much an infrastructure heavy space. There are a number of applications that are being built, but they're not quite the same as like in a centralized space. And so a lot of the things that still get funded in the space are infrastructure heavy. Um, because there's still a ton of problems around, like, for example, there's this proliferation of layer twos right now. But because of that, if you have like 100, if not 1,000 layer twos, there's also liquidity fragmentation. So the user experience is not great. So you have to like go through a bridge, transfer your assets. And then uh, if you want to interact with a specific application, then you need a specific token for uh, maybe gas. And then you have to switch a lot of things. And so it's like a very cumbersome uh, user experience. And so there's a lot of infrastructure that's being built to address that, but it's still not at a, at a space and time where it's like super smooth, super easy to use, just like in a centralized context. But um, definitely encourage uh, other builders to check out the combination of um, decentralized AI or Web3 meets AI, because there's a lot that we can do to keep uh, AI models and AI agents in the future from being dishonest and not aligned with human interests. And so that's why we believe so strongly in this idea of AI being a public good. And so definitely encourage a lot of developers to look at that intersection um, to make sure that we don't have a handful of companies basically controlling most of our economy when AI agents start taking over.